Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon, so I actually really appreciated the great beer. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, we all set? Okay, I don't have to be that close to the mic. All right. All right. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Um, but uh, so I'm gonna be. I, this is a presentation actually I did at DEF CON. There's uh, some slight modifications to it. Um, but uh, just to give you guys a background. My name is Ken Weston. I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, it's a lot like Grand Rapids actually, except uh, weed isn't legal here. So my presentation may not be as entertaining as I think it is. Um, I uh, actually developed a number of theft recovery tools. Um, I actually uh, was able to actually utilize these tools and work very closely with law enforcement. Um, and I learned a lot along the way. It actually allowed me to do hacking uh, legally, right? So um, developing tr basically Trojans that are friendly, um, tracking criminals who people steal laptops. Um, it actually led to seeing um, a lot in the underground and sort of how criminals work, how uh, stolen property gets fenced. Uh, ended up recovering a lot of stolen property, um, unveiled a lot of other crimes too, even recovered stolen vehicles, um, helped so solve crimes like carjackings and things like that as well. And I'm going to walk through some of the uh, technologies and the tools that I actually uh, use for that. So I, I have assisted law enforcement as well in a number of investigations, um, helping them, and, and not just in uh, theft recovery, but also um, utilizing uh, some of the data mining tools for helping to track um, online predators. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, particularly with um, mining image uh, data, for, uh, XF image data. Um, so I have put a lot of people in jail with data, which is sort of um, sort of unique, right? So it's it's crazy to think that one piece of data can actually be used uh, for uh, putting people in jail and, and solving crimes. Um, I'm currently a security specialist. I can't say where I work, but it's a machine data company. I'll leave it at that. Um, so when I actually presented at, uh, at DEF CON, if you ever want to get uh, become a target for doxing, uh, present at DEF CON. It's awesome. Uh, the, the press called me a professional cyber stalker. I got called the real life Mr. Robot. That was awesome. Um, and then uh, an Oregon business actually had to profile me on the good hacker. So I um, talked a lot about um, how I'm able to leverage these technologies um, for good, right? Um, so this is my, I like to call my wall of shame. Um, so these are actually photos from actual people that I've, I've put in jail. Um, you'll notice a lot of them are webcam photos. So um, basically the technology I built uh, would actually utilize the web camera to capture photos of the person. Um, I also helped recover stolen phones, USB devices, iPods, and a number of other, other um, uh, devices. So I'll, I'll talk about um, some of those cases specifically as we go through the presentation. I want to talk a little bit about my theory though. I'm kind of a liberal arts nerd. So um, anyone know who this is? This is Edmund Lacard. So there's this thing called Lacard's Exchange Principle. So Edmund Lacard was a forensic uh, investigator. He was sort of a, one of the first forensic scientists, really. He actually founded uh, forensic science. He's from France. Um, and he had this thing called Edmund Lacard's Exchange Principle that every contact leaves a trace. Of course, he was dealing with uh, physical crimes. But the idea is that whenever a crime is committed, they always uh, leave something behind or they take something with them. Um, there's always something that, um, that, that occurs in that case. There's always a trace. Um, this is before fingerprints, this is before DNA, so he sort of uh, r really thought ahead. And I believe this applies to the digital world as well. It's all only a matter of where you look for the data, um, how you collect that information. Um, when there is a crime committed, uh, be it a, a breach, there's always going to be a trace in the logs. There's got to be a way to find it. Um, so that's kind of my theory. And one thing I found, too, is that there's all these pieces of data that are out there. And really, when you're able to take all these sort of individual pieces of data, like a social security number, device IDs, IP address, a phone number, geolocation, usernames, that's one thing. But when we actually start to able to con connect that, we can actually develop a profile of an individual. And this data comes from a lot of different sources, um, and even more so with IoT. Uh, we're able to get, grab a lot of data from you know, Fitbit devices, um, and so there's a lot of information out there, and a lot of times people think that oh, this is you know this can't identify me um, in this log or this website that I go to. Um, that's not necessarily the case. When you start to draw those correlations, or a new technology would allow you to draw those correlations, um, some really interesting things are going to happen. And I, I I talk about interaction of things. So when I look at data, there's data that's actually created by us, right? So these are things that we're conscious of when we're interacting with our devices. We're actually uh, we're able to um, you know, we tweet, we put emails out there, we have calendars. Those, those, these are, these are things we're aware of and that we're putting out there. 
but as a result of that, when we were actually interacting with the devices, there's actually data cr uh, created for us as well. So um, analytics or when you uh, a web page gets created, right? So we have um, data that's from our, our boarding passes, a lot of information like that. But there's also in this process, there's data that's actually created about us as well uh, that a lot of times we're not aware of. Um, and that information gets aggregated, it gets shared. Um, and that, and when you're able to mine that information, you can draw some inter interesting connections. And then there's what I like to call boogie data. So boogie data is information that's gathered in logs, it's out there, um, that a lot of times people think, um, hey, th th it, this is totally not uh, going to identify me uh, at all. For example, when someone sends an SMS message, right, when I del if I delete that and the other person deletes it, there's no record, right? Wrong. There's over 20 log files that get generated throughout the wireless carrier with that information, right? So there's a lot of cases like that where a lot of this data is just sitting in there, it's sort of dormant, and a lot of it gets archived. We're talking like terabytes of data in some of these companies. It's just a massive amounts of data about us um, that at some point, when that information does get mined, it's going to unveil some really interesting things about us and our activities. Um, so kind of get started too is uh, not a lot of fans of some of my work. I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, this is from uh, when I actually tried to do a, a talk at Black Hat. Um, I, I think you should reflect on the ethical implications of the technology you're happily distributing. Um, and you'll kind of see through this presentation that my goal is to actually educate and, and do good. Um, I've never had any sort of malicious intent. Uh, my goal has always been to utilize the technology to track criminals but also to educate other people about how that same, these same t tools and techniques can be used to track you by criminals themselves. Um, I got started with this. Uh, I was really interested in, um, in USB uh, malware. Uh, I actually started a website called USB Hacks. Um, and there's a number of exploit tools, and um, a lot of people actually ask for some of these tools, so I actually put them up on this website. Um, be very careful when you download those. Don't run them on your system, please. Um, uh, but uh, there are a lot of, I was just really interested in how people were able to compromise networks because I'm lazy. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go and try to hack an external network when I can just uh, get someone to insert a flash drive or if I can get inside of a company and insert a flash drive, I can steal data. Uh, it's a lot easier that way to actually infiltrate a network. Um, and so that's kind of how I got started with all this stuff. And then I, I was working on my master's uh, degree and I, I figured out I want to find a way to utilize this technology for good. Um, so what I did was I took a lot of the, the, the concepts that were being developed for USB malware and I, I turned it into a happy Trojan. Thanks, Bob. Um, so the idea here is that you, you take a, 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 something that you actually you install on your device yourself um, and if it gets plugged into a computer, it'll Trojanize that device and it'll send information out. So the idea here is it was for theft recovery purposes. So if you steal my flash drive or another USB removable media device, um, you plug it into your computer, I'm going to get your username. I'm going to get a lot of other information about it that I can maybe use to recover that device. And it was sort of a theory that I had. Uh, and I put it out there for free um, as a tool. And uh, it ended up getting on, uh, back then it was uh, Dig. Uh, I got, my website got dug to death. Um, and uh, and from there, I actually, I got some a little bit of funding to, to kind of build this out and build a pro version. And I found that there were a number of other devices that this worked with. It wasn't just flash drives. It also worked with um, the, the original iPods back then. Um, it also worked with uh, GPS devices, uh, external hard drives, uh, and, and, and cameras. And uh, so I actually, I, I put up the actual code for this Windows USB client. So if you guys want to download it and take a look at it. Uh, that's, that's the actual original source code for it. Um, it's not very complex. It doesn't need to be. Um, I took advantage of, you know, basic auto run capability, which is basically a vulnerability. What I think, I think they patched it finally like a year ago. <laughs> but, um, and, but it would also leverage other things too. So not just an auto run, but you can also disguise, um, some of the files to look like something that someone wants to click on, like a, a passwords.exe or a, an MP3 file, something like that. Um, so, one thing I found is that you know we were able to collect IP address and things like that, and working with law enforcement actually recovering stolen devices. Um, you know there was a lot of issues with this because you know getting IP address doesn't necessarily mean an attribution. Um, you guys probably run in this a lot of cases when there are data breaches, an IP address. You know it's 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 helpful, but it's not going to be the smoking gun. Um, it does require a lot of work by law enforcement, and I found that a lot of times law enforcement they don't like to work. So I know it's I know you guys are shocked. Uh, 
And also, it's not identity, so it doesn't put a person in front of the computer. That's the key. Is like it doesn't actually put identify the person that was in front of that computer at that time. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but probable cause, you know, it's increasingly challenged uh, for that as well. It's not always accurate through proxies, and then I, it takes a long time. And then IPv6, oh, fuck. Um, so this is the first iPod recovery where we actually got a connection through. I know it's kind of small. I apologize. Uh, I could have blown that up a bit. But you know, we got information on the, this one where um, we got the ISP. But the most important thing we got was the username, and it was this uh, Calopagus family, right? Um, and we 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 got this connection. Uh, they were able to take this, and there was only one uh, kid that had that name in the school, so you, know, you got busted. So what's interesting is that it's not necessarily IP address, but getting other th information like username, uh, trying to mine the systems for any sort of I identifiers for uh, an individual. Um, any any clue that you can get, that's what we were gathering. Um, I put this out there, got, um, I got a lot of uh, press from it, um, and I actually got approached by a company. Um, they, they make th uh, thermal imaging cameras. Um, they're very high-end cameras. These devices cost anywhere from $3,000 to $300,000 a piece. Um, and not only for theft recovery, but a lot of these devices, too, they're not allowed to be in certain, uh, sold in certain countries, and they were having issues with this, where some of these devices were ending up in Iran. Uh, in other countries, and they were trying to figure out, you know, who was selling these to them. Um, so I worked with them and actually developed, uh, 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 got to go a little deeper, where we developed the agent, but we also embedded it into the firmware. Um, so we were able to then identify um, specifically, um, you know, where this was coming from. We also had a number of IDs that were embedded in that as well. So when they would open it um, on the on the uh, like a uh, SD card. Um, that, like if you if you wiped it and you put a new one in the the camera saw that and it would actually reinstall the agent on the next one So we were able to um, kind of have a, a little bit of a persistence with it um, And then we also had an ID for the menu uh, the, the distributor So we were able to identify specifically who was selling it to these particular uh, countries So it was uh, it was kind of my, my one of my first kind of big deals in my startup I actually uh, was able to actually quit my job uh, my day job and do this full-time which was which, which was a lot, a lot of fun, actually. And this is uh, actually what I would do, too, is that we disguise the agent as a uh, thermal image itself. And this is the actual image I used of a cat, of course. Um, and actually, when I was working on these presentations, I, you know, I went back to some of my code because people were asking about Macs. You know, they're totally secure. You can't do the same thing on those. Well, you can. Um, it's not going to be like auto run capability and things like that, but there are some really interesting things I found. Um, and when I was going back, I looked at some of the old code I had, and I would use AppleScript. And why would I use AppleScript? Um, it's trusted. Um, it's um, it's also uh, interfaced with most of the OSX applications. Um, it's basically PowerShell for OSX. You have access to a lot of information, a lot of um, interfaces with other applications. I'm also incredibly lady, lazy and a very shitty programmer, so AppleScript works really well for me. I'm not going to do anything in Objective-C. Sorry. Um, but one thing I discovered was that um, um, if you put a like a dot mp3 on a, a OSX, uh, one of these scripts, then um, OSX has a security thing in there where it'll actually throw a dot app on it so people know it's an application. Um, but that's very easy to circumvent. And I can go ahead and talk about this because I, I sent this over to Apple and they said it wasn't a vulnerability, so we're totally safe. So here's the idea is that uh, you know, Justin Bieber, .mp3 app. So I use this character, it's called an Oganek. It's a Turkish character, it looks like a period. And if I throw that on, on it and I put .mp3, it doesn't throw the .app on it. So I also disguise the icon, make it look like it's a, um, uh, an mp3. Um, so it's pretty simple. And uh, if I, we have time at the end of this, um, I'll actually run the, the Trojan on my system and I'll show you how it works. Um, and I, I have uh, some of the, the script available too. So you can actually modify in the package, you can actually modify the icon that's showing it here. Um, and here's just a little sample of the script. It's not very complex, um, but there's this uh, object called sysinfo where you can gather information about the system. Um, and then what I would use is, I, I used iTunes uh, to, to exfiltrate data from the device. Um, instead of trying to use a browser or something like that, that's going to raise suspicion. Um, so what I did was I, I gathered all the data and then I sent it out through a query string through um, iTunes out to a remote server. So I get uh, some information like uh, the, the name of the user and other information. Um, there's also objects where you can actually grab what applications are currently running, and you can actually grab some data uh, from those as well. Um, and uh, if you actually see on the bottom of this, this is actually, um, you can actually run shell scripts as well from AppleScript, which is pretty cool. 
there was actually a, an exploit uh, for OSX about a year or two ago, um, and that's why I actually show an example here. So if you run this on your Mac, make sure you've, you've updated your system in the last two years. Yeah, please. Um, and the, the code is actually available here. Sorry, it's, it's github.com slash kweston uh, slash apple razor. So if you can go there, you can see the full Apple script. It's available there if you want to play with it. Just be careful. Um, but it's really neat, too, is that I would pass that data through iTunes, and then what I, I can do, too, is so you can't see the, what I, I got passed in the query string, I would then also then immediately stream an MP3 from that server. Um, so when you run it, 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 it looks like you clicked on an MP3, and it's going to start sending data, and then it's also going to load up an MP3 from a remote server, so you don't know that I'm actually running code in the background. So you'd think that, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with USB flash drives, uh, you know, we'd be done with this. No. Uh, we've seen this as an attack factor with Stuxnet. Um, USB malware, too. We've seen it in the International Space Station. Um, in 2012, we've even seen, seen, like, with Stuxnet and a lot of ICS uh, plants, um, they're still vulnerable to these as well. Um, I'm surprised when I go into some customer sites and uh, on the industrial side, and they're still running Windows XP. Um, and because these systems, they, they can't update them fast enough, right? So, um, so some of these USB attack vectors are still, um, it's, it's still a threat, uh, particularly in healthcare and then industrial. Um, and also in, in Black Hat 2015, people were still spreading out flash drives and people were still taking them and plugging them into their computers and their data was still getting stolen. And we also have other new, more advanced threats like USB killer. So kind of moving on, uh, you know, it's one thing to have um, some uh, like IP address, things like that, but it's a l better to actually start connecting some of those dots. Uh, sometimes people call these the crazy walls. You guys have probably seen it like in CSI where they start drawing connections. So the, the connections, it's, re it's really important when you're doing an investigation. So one of the first uh, flash drives I recovered, um, it was actually stolen from a professor. Oh, I need some water here. It was stolen from a professor, and uh, he had the agent installed on the device, and so I helped him with the recovery. And, you know, the first connections we got just mapped to an ISP. It didn't really tell us a lot of information. There's not a whole lot we could do there. Um, it's very difficult, again, to get, like, a subpoena to get the information, and by then, you know, obviously the person's probably moved on. Um, but with the second uh, and third connections we got, it was actually um, in, in a university. So we actually mapped it out to the University of North Texas. Um, so we had some internal IP address. We also had the external. We knew wh where it was. We contacted the university. We worked with them on it. Um, and we discovered that we also had our timestamp. And that's really important. Time is very important when you're dealing with forensics and logs. Uh, so we, we grabbed the, the timestamp. We also found, after talking to the university, that they required um, key badges. And they were also logging that data as well. So we, had some, we were able to identify who was actually in that computer lab at this given time. And they also had cameras, um, and a lot of times people don't realize that a lot of logs are actually generated from these as well, so you can actually map out specifically, um, you know, within a time window uh, of who was actually in that room. And from this, we were actually able to get the flash drive back. We identified that it was a student that had taken it, um, and uh, we got it back for them. So it was, he had his dissertation on there. It was, it was more, more of the data that was on that was more valuable to him. Um, so after the USB stuff, I moved into laptops. I was kind of curious, um, you know, how can we better protect laptops? There are a number of theft recovery tools out there, and a lot of them seemed rather invasive. Um, a lot of them actually had backdoors into the system that um, the, the companies would, would have access to. Um, and, you know, I looked at the laptops and they all had web cameras, and, and there's a lot of um, data that we can actually grab from these systems. Um, I also looked at, um, this is back when the first iPhone got, was created, and they were using um, Wi-Fi for geolocation. I go, what if we could do that for, for a Mac for a stolen computer? Um, so it was actually the first to actually deploy um, a, a tool to actually track location using Wi-Fi networks and using the web camera to um, capture a photo of the suspect. So, for example, if it was stolen, we would um, identify, uh, the, the user would log in, they would activate tracking. At that time, I used Flickr um, because I didn't want to have to create my own infrastructure and have to secure it because, I'm, again, I'm lazy. Um, but it worked out really well. Just utilize the Flickr API. It goes to the Flickr account, um, and then they were able to get photos of the person. We also had the, the uh, location information. It was accurate within 10 to 20 meters. So uh, geolocation, we were using uh, Skyhook Wireless. Uh, now it's pretty much embedded in every operating system, so it's actually available through um, just common APIs. Um, you can also uh, access through the Google Maps API. So here's the link that you can actually you know, pass information through, and you can get location. So it's a lot easier now than when I was doing it. You kids and your technology, it's a lot easier for you guys. 
So the first recovery I had was actually, um, uh, it was back in New York. Um, it was an iMac that was stolen, um, and uh, we activated the tracking, and we got these photos. Um, dealing with law enforcement was really frustrating. Uh, the, the police officer I was dealing with uh, didn't understand technology. He dealt with some of the older uh, approaches to theft recovery, and he goes, I have to fill out a bunch of paperwork. i got to get a subpoena. I have to do all this stuff. I'm like, no, dude, print out a photo. All right, We have the location within 10 to 20 meters. Print out the photo and ask around, like, if anyone's seen this guy. And he's like, yeah, don't tell me how to do my job, all right? And, uh, and then, sure enough, that's what he did. And it uh, turns out it was this guy that had a, t a tattoo parlor. Um, this is the, uh, in the back of his office. And you'll notice there's a lot of other really cool gear that's back there, this huge big screen TV. Um, you know, there's a bunch of com um, music equipment and things like that. He's almost like a producer in his little office. Um, they went in, they recovered not only the, um, our, uh, the customer's iMac, but also three laptops that were from different cases as well. So that's where I started to see that a lot of times when these devices are getting recovered, that's how I can get law enforcement interested because 80% of the time they're going to find other crimes that have been committed, other stolen property and things like that. And, and now that cop, he, be, he wanted to be good friends. Next time I'm in New York, he wanted me to, to go there and we're going to go to a baseball game together. That's cool. Um, so we had another situation in, in Portland, Oregon, where I live, um, where a bunch of schools were getting uh, robbed uh, repeatedly of laptops. Um, and so I actually worked with them. I said, hey, I'll help you guys out because they, they kept coming back. They would get new laptops and they would get stolen again, right? And so I said, hey, I'm going to install software on some of these bait laptops. Let's leave them out and see what happens. Sure enough, a week later, they got, they got, uh, they, they got stolen and we were able to track them uh, to uh, Vancouver, which is just, uh, just um, north of Portland, Oregon. Uh, we were able to get uh, information. Um, we, we, we got photos of the, the, uh, this guy. Um, we tracked it to a specific location. This was a challenge because, again, police, they went to this location, um, but it was a duplex. And I even told them, I go, it's within 10 meters of uh, accuracy. It's not going to tell you, you know, GPS exactly. And so he goes to, to one side, and the cop actually knew the guy that was there. It's the guy that does his roof. And he's like, he started telling me the technology doesn't work. You know what the hell you're doing, whatever. You're wasting our time. So um, I drove out there, and I actually I, uh, had my laptop, and I was sniffing the Wi-Fi networks that were out there. And the, there was a, a Russian, uh, um, uh, that was the name of the Wi-Fi network, and on this guy's car, it was actually next to that, that's the house that he went to, there was this big Russian pride bumper sticker, right? And I'm sitting there with my Wi-Fi, and I, okay, this is totally right, we got the location, and out walks someone from the house, it's the guy that we have a photo of, right? Um, and he starts looking at me, and I just look at my computer real quick, like I'm just looking for directions. Um, it scared the crap out of me, because uh, these guys are pretty bad news. Um, and so then I called the detective, told him, and then they came out. Uh, in this case, they actually ended up uh, arresting six people. Um, they didn't know that our technology actually tracked them. The police got them to believe they all ratted on each other, which was awesome. I think they know now. Uh, another case I had was this guy named Victor. Um, this one was really frustrating because uh, a laptop got stolen um, and we didn't get any connections for like two weeks. Um, and so I, um, I was really fr frustrated and we started getting pings finally um, and it was in Missouri of all places, right? How the hell did the laptop get to Missouri? And I was getting these photos of this guy and, and uh, it was really, he did a really nice thing for us because he went into the computer and actually changed the username to his full name. So um, we, we were gathering that information. But, but I was getting photos from him doing all kinds of weird shit. There was like a photo of him in a hotel, and there's like a girl in the background. Some weird stuff was happening there. So I know I, I felt felt a little dirty, but Victor did steal a laptop. So um, we also found, you know, from his name, I was able to get other information. I identified his MySpace profile. Um, I also discovered that he was really into Scion. He's really into cars. Um, so we mined information from various forums, which was cool because he liked to take photos of his car, so we also had his license plate number. That was great. Um, so he was also a power seller on eBay. Um, he was selling car parts. Kind of gives you an idea of what he, he does for a living. Um, probably mostly stolen parts. Um, and then Victor was nice. He ended up selling the, that laptop along with the stolen bike to his friend. So we had a photo of him as well. Um, and this was a case where we actually worked with the district attorney, and they said, you know, you've actually gathered enough information. If you, even if he doesn't have the laptop, um, we're able to get him, bust him for stolen property, right? So they, the, the police were really, um, really appreciated the help we gave, gave them. So I even had his phone number. I had all kinds of other data about him as well. So I had a lot of these kind of recoveries. I mean, there's quite a few of them, um, but, uh, you know, this was one of my favorites. Um, there was another one we had that was actually in Brazil where um, someone actually did a carjacking. 
Um, there was this guy who was a veterinary student, um, and uh, these guys, they pulled them out of the car and just beat the crap out of them. Um, one guy almost to death. Um, and then they did, drove off, and uh, the uh, customer's laptop was in the back. Um, and then they, of course, they sold it once they found it. Um, we ended up getting it back for them. And then in this particular case, not only did we recover stolen property, but we also um, were able to get some people that were pretty, pretty mean and, and help solve an assault case as well. Um, so then, you know, after laptops, I kind of got into the mobile. Like, what can we do with mobile as well? Um, the geolocation was easier because, you know, they all have um, GPS enabled in the device. Um, IP address, of course, is going to be more problematic. Um, that's not going to get me down to an ISP or someone's house. Um, we also then did photo and con uh, in contact um, backups. Um, I was very concerned about doing backups of people's information because if our system gets hacked, they have access to all of our information. Um, and I was very paranoid about it. So when we did it, we made it so that you would enter a privacy key and your data would get encrypted on your device before it gets sent to our cloud system. So not even I would have access to your data. If the FBI came to me and said, hey, we need this person's photos and contacts, okay, here's the encrypted blob. You got to go to, th to them to get the encryption key. Um, it just turns out this was a really good idea. So we see with the fappening and some other cases where, you know, some of these backup systems get, get um, jacked and now someone has access to all of your information. And I'm going to play a video here. This actually is a, I actually worked with uh, uh, a local news crew on uh, uh, the, the mobile security software I built actually started uh, used by Sprint and some other stores to actually put in their demo units. So uh, this was a really in interesting case and I think you guys will enjoy it that's helping track them down. News Channel 8's Ed Teachout spent the past two days with police and investigators on the trail of swiped cell phones. He's live outside the Washington Square Mall where the theft took place. Ed. Well, the managers of the Sprint store here at the Washington Square Mall behind me say they're very confident that tracking software developed only miles away from here and put onto their demo phones will lead to an arrest. Uh, this is a $500 phone. This ends up being a $450 phone. Two empty display cradles are all that remains after someone stole two demo cell phones from the Sprint store at Washington Square Mall on Saturday. Moments after surveillance video caught the theft on tape, employees initiated tracking software installed on the stolen phones. They were able to not only find the GPS location of the individuals that took them, uh, but also we've been able to uh, to monitor any activity that happens in the phone. That activity turned out to be pictures someone took shortly after the phones were stolen. Tiger police admit it's a brave new world when pictures taken on cell phones can be told to send back pictures once they're stolen. And that has not only piqued the interest of our investigators, but in essence uh, appears um, at this point could be very credible information for us to follow up on. The Portland creator of the software tracking the theft says police are on the right track. If they're not the thieves, they definitely know who stole it. And if you look over the head of this man, you'll see in the window an Oregon temporary permit. Philip, this is Ed. With the help of a gadget track investigator on the phone, we tracked the stolen phone signal to this Vancouver apartment complex. There we found the exact temporary permit and... Hi. The young woman who told us off camera, a man she called Peter, had sent this photo to her Saturday evening, but says she knew nothing about the phones. Hi, my name is Ed. We tracked the second cell phone signal to this duplex about eight blocks away. You don't have an, a Samsung Epic phone in this location? No. The police were here yesterday looking for it. We're back live now outside the Washington Square Mall where we've just obtained within the hour the DMV records on that temporary permit. Tiger police say they hope the men in the pictures will contact them soon so they can explain how their faces ended up on a stolen cell phone. Back to you. Thank you, Ed Teachout. Yeah. So in that, uh, so in that particular case, um, we 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 had the the surveillance photos. We had um, also a, um, you know the photos that they took of themselves. So they were taking selfies and they're sending it to this girl. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, and we we're also able to get some GPS data from the photos. Um, and we got location. One challenge with this was that the, we weren't getting very accurate GPS from some of the phones. Um, I'm not sure if it's a, the Samsung Galaxy issue, but we were getting very accurate location information from the photos. So that was really uh, nice to have that as a backup. And we did, you know, get the photo of the, the guy, and we I noticed that there was a trip permit on the on the back. So that was really helpful. Again, th they made it a lot easier. 
In this particular case, they, uh, they actually found a theft ring. There were about uh, six to seven people that got arrested as a result of it. Um, and they also recovered a stolen car. It wasn't this one, but there was another, um, another um, one of the other guys had a stolen vehicle. So, so I learned a lot too. When I was looking at um, you know images, uh, I got really interested in this, um, and I started looking at some of the metadata. Um, you know, GPS coordinates is one thing that's helpful. Um, you know, cell phone cameras are going to have that capability. They also have the timestamp, which is really good evidence. Um, but I also started discovering that in really high-end digital cameras, the make and model and serial number are actually embedded in the cameras. Um, and you can actually look at that with XF tool. And I actually created a quick little website called XF.io where you can actually upload a photo. And if it actually finds a serial number, it'll show you. Um, but I found, what if there's a way to search for this information? I, I knew that you could do some Google searches and maybe, you know, you, you get lucky. Um, but there really wasn't anyone that's actually mined this information and created a search engine. Um, so kind of being the, the guy that I am, I, I found that these are all the cameras that are actually, um, uh, that will actually embed the, the make, model, and serial number of the camera. You know, when we look at um, some of the evidence for photos too, um, there's a lot of data that's available in there. We can identify, you know, what, what device took it. And it's useful when, uh, you know, I was helping with a, a reporter. They wanted to know about, you know, some of these um, nude photos from celebrities. You know, uh, with Scarlett Johansson, they, the, the media kept claiming that the phone was hacked. They got into the phone. Um, no, um, the EXIF data actually revealed that there were multiple phones over the course of several years. Of course, I downloaded the images and mined it for research purposes. Uh, so the point of compromise was actually email, right? It wasn't actually the phone was hacked. I um, mean, it was Chris Cheney. He had guessed the passwords, and, and uh, he got busted, and he's now serving 10 years in jail. Um, so looking at exit mining, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of um, uh, data that was actually available, uh, at Flickr in particular. I was going to build this all out. So, um, so I had a theory. I wanted to mine uh, and actually identify um, if I can see if I can create a database of, of this data. Um, but Flickr really limits you on how many uh, queries you can make. Uh, but at the time, I was actually advising a, a company called CP Usage that sort of had like a SETI at home type of thing where um, they had like a bunch of customers and you can actually pay them to, for their computer's idle time. So I had access to like thousands of computers, some of them in like uh, universities and things like that. So basically what I did was I farmed out this Python script that would go in and we mined all of uh, Flickr within a course of about three to four weeks. Um, we actually mined all the EXIF data from all the images. Um, I actually talked to someone at Yahoo afterwards and like, that was you? <laughs> they, they were trying to figure out who was, who was doing this stuff. But yeah, we actually created a database. Um, and I also found other sites too, like the 500 picks, Panoromeo. Uh, TwitPic, and I found Twitter. Even though they'll actually um, they'll they'll remove all the EXIF data from the image when you upload them, they uh, they weren't doing that with your profile photos. So I was finding these tiny little icons, and they had all this EXIF data that wasn't available in it. So I knew you could actually identify where someone was and the serial number of the camera they took and stuff. So it was really interesting research. Um, so the idea is that we would you know we mined all this data, and then I created a search engine. Um, and uh, we, we had, uh, the, it was just millions and millions of cameras. And then I, I put it out there just as a free tool that people can search their cameras for. The idea is to recover stolen cameras. Um, and it wasn't uh, too long we actually had a case. Um, there was a guy named uh, John Heller. Uh, so he's a professional photographer. He was on assignment for uh, Getty Images. Um, and he uh, was at the Egyptian theater and turned around and $9,000 worth of camera equipment was stolen. It was gone. Um, and he thought it was gone forever until a year later he, he heard about this tool and he goes, hey, I'm going to search my, my serial, the, the camera. Uh, he entered it in and he got a hit. Um, so he did a search and he, we, we mapped it out to a Flickr account. Uh, and then that Flickr account mapped to a Facebook uh, account of another professional photographer. And he just happened to have photos of all his camera gear and there, there was his camera. Um, we, he contacted the LAPD. Um, and so what happened was, you know, the camera was stolen. The guy stole it. Um, he then sold it on Craigslist. That, the person that bought it on Craigslist sold it on eBay later on, right? And so there was this whole process. And so we went to the person that had it, and uh, he said, hey, I didn't see a lot about it on eBay. They go to the eBay seller. The eBay seller, yeah, I bought it from a guy on Craigslist. This is like, like almost like a year and a half later. They go to the apartment where the guy bought it on Craigslist, and the, the, they go in and they find this guy, and he's got all kinds of other stolen property in his apartment. So this is an interesting case because a lot of people didn't realize this was possible. A lot of people didn't realize that um, you know just having uh, an image or having a serial number can actually be tracked a stolen camera. Um, so it's one of those examples I think where new technology, as we evolve and we find ways of getting this information, you know, there's ways of this can lead back to us, right? So a lot of folks didn't realize that this is possible, and now a lot of camera thieves now they're thinking twice about stealing cameras. 
Um, so there was another case too where a guy on Craigslist, uh, he was selling his camera um, and uh, some people uh, came to his place, they said they had cash. Um, they went out to his garage to show him the, the camera and then they punched him in the face, knocked him out to the ground and stole his camera and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but we were able to get information uh, from this. We got, we got the name. Uh, we did some additional investigation uh, on uh, the person that, that had the camera. Um, he wasn't a very good dude. He actually kept changing his cameras like every few months and he, he, he advertised himself as a professional photographer for models. Um, interesting dude. Uh, but we, doing more research, I was able to get, you know, his address from his domain registration. He had, he was a, a professional photographer and a, a DJ. Got a cell phone number, social media photo sharing accounts. Um, we started mining a lot of other information from him. And he also likes to take photos of him and his friends doing weed, which was, I don't know, in Oregon it's cool, but not, not where he was from. Um, and, uh, he also had an unlicensed firearm. He likes to show how hardcore he is, take photos of that. Um, also, he likes to take photos of him and his girlfriend driving down the freeway, smoking weed. But he also took a photo of his speedometer going about over 100 miles an hour, um, which isn't smart because you have geolocation and a timestamp, so the guy's kind of a dumbass. Um, police loved this. It was great. There was all kinds of things we got him for. It was good. Um, the, this, uh, what's interesting is this, uh, I had a lot of, some other recoveries and people were using it, but, um, I actually got reached out to by, um, by ICE. They wanted to use this information too. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, some child porn images, they'll have, um, EXIF data that, that are embedded in them. Um, so I gave them free access to, to via API to the data. Um, and the idea here is that if, um, someone takes a, a, a photo, um, like maybe with their family, right, um, that camera may have been used in some of these cases, or you may even find that Joe Perv, he's using it for this, um, this, um, for, for child porn, but then he also uses the same camera when he's, when he takes his family to Disneyland, right, so we can, we can get these connections as well. Um, I'm not sure if it was actually caught anybody, they couldn't say, but, um, I thought it was a really interesting use case for it. And, you know, um, so there other data too, um, I'm not sure you guys, when I talk about a lot of the data that, uh, you know, that, that can come out like boogie data, the Ashley Madison's a good example. I was actually in, involved in an investigation. Um, there was a, um, an executive, he was already kind of suspect in some of the things he was doing. Um, actually found, uh, uh, he was using a company email address for his Ashley Madison account. Um, he was actually also using the corporate card, the corporate debit card, uh, for those purchases, for the subscription. Um, and he also used the company billing address. So, so if you're going to be doing um, those kind of websites, don't use your corporate card. Just saying. Um, but the reason he was doing it, he was he was kind of covering up because he didn't want his wife to find out what he was doing, so he used the corporate card. And um, this led to a, a deeper investigation. He was doing all kinds of things, like with hotels and other things, basically cheating on his wife and using the corporate card to do it. So. Um, and then, you know, another thing is that uh, a lot of times people use phone numbers and other information. So when you're doing like OSN, um, it's really helpful to mine that data because a lot of times that's going to be pe people's passwords. Uh, one example, um, I'm going to play this. Um, this is, I got um, asked to help hack a $6 million smart home that they said was unhackable. Um, we did this on Prime uh, Time TV, which is a lot of fun, sort of like a reality type show. Um, so I'm going to play this. But the important thing here is that the guy used his cell phone number as his password. Right, so that's how we were able to get in. So this isn't like some Mr. Robot stuff. You'll even see um, through this whole thing, the passwords were really basic and simple. Um, so I'll just play this off. I'm gonna shut up, hold on. One of our big goals here at Crime Watch Daily is to protect you. And today we have a frightening investigation. If you have Wi-Fi, did you know hackers can literally take over your entire home and just about everything inside? Anna Garcia is about to show you just how easily it can be done. We built our dream house here in Southern California and absolutely love it. We're just a few steps away from the beach. Vicki Johnson's new beachfront house is not only spectacular, it's smart. She can control most everything from her phone or tablet. It's pretty smart. <laughs> the drapes go up and down automatically. We can close doors. We can flush toilets. We can turn lights on and off. We can turn the air conditioning on and off. TVs, music. It's a brilliant house. A secure fortress, she thinks. We were told it was hack proof. We'll see about that. Vicky, who is a Crime Watch Daily producer, has agreed to let us launch a cyber attack on her house. 
She's throwing a party for some unsuspecting guests. They think they're coming to take a tour of a smart house. But what we're really doing is hacking her house during the party and potentially the devices of every guest who walks through the front door. Helping me are two cybersecurity experts from Tripwire, a company that secures the computer systems for nearly half the Fortune 500 companies. We've hidden cameras inside the house, mounted more cameras in the SUV, where I'll be working with the hackers, Craig Young and Ken Weston. So first we need to break into the Wi-Fi. In the world of cyber criminals, a home's Wi-Fi is the new front door. This antenna is step one to picking the virtual lock. This antenna gives us a survey of what wireless networks are here. Vicky has 28 devices connected to the home's wireless internet. Once they were into the Wi-Fi system, our hackers were quickly able to commandeer the home's cameras. These are the security cameras to the house that you've hacked into. Exactly. Here we actually can see this is actually our car out here. This is the front door. Ken is able to take control of the security cameras because they have a separate password and it is ridiculously easy. If you don't um, secure them properly, then they become insecurity cameras. Once our hackers are in, every security barrier falls like a line of dominoes. This party's over. And the cyber attack is about to begin. First, we turn off the lights. Then, with control of the security cameras, we divert the video signal and play it on the TV in the living room. With everyone's attention on the TV, the hackers talk to the guests. We have taken control of this house, the lights, the security cameras. Now a special message from me in the car is piped in. I'm Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily, and this house has just been hacked. We hacked your home! <laughs> yeah, so it's been a lot of... A little dramatic, but... Uh... It was a lot of fun, actually. You could do that for free. But that's the thing is, like, we, you know, we, uh, um, we, we were getting the Wi-Fi. We actually use a cloud cracking service because uh, we were again we're lazy. Uh, it cost us 200 bucks to get the password crack, and we got it back. And I go, that looks like a cell phone number. Um, and then we do a search for it, and it's, it's, it's the the guy's website. Like, it's a cell phone number, and he has it on his website. So if we actually did a little more homework and we weren't lazy, uh, we could have found that without having to pay 200 dollars. But um, it was interesting when you when you get in there. Like once people crack the Wi-Fi network, um, you know you're able to um, um, to do quite a bit. A lot of times they use default passwords and things like that. But it's another example where if you have just a little bit of information about someone, just a little piece of, of data can actually lead to you know, pretty catastrophic results. So, um, and that that's pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Anybody? Um, you can reach me on I'm on, t I'm on the Twitters at uh, K Weston. Uh, you can email me at kweston at gmail.com. But great. Well, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it.